and I think it slowed down. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today to listen to me, Mrs. Joanna Gillen and Dr. Charlotte Proudman. We're going to talk to you very briefly about the variation of financial orders and the things you're going to want to look at. Uh, hopefully you're old hats at this now, but to those that are new to these seminars, you are automatically on mute so we can't hear you. These seminars are being recorded and the recording is going to be put hopefully on the website Goldsmith Chambers tomorrow together with the slides so you can download those but any difficulties you can contact our clerks and the email address will be at the end of these slides so you can take a quick note to get the slides if you need them. Uh, there is a button on your screen that's marked Q&A if you have any questions please do ask and at the end of this seminar hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to go through a few of your questions should you have any that you'd like to ask. So with that, let's begin. Uh, what are we discussing? Well, as I said, we're going to be discussing variation of financial orders. There are three main ways that you're going to be doing that. That's under section 31 of the Matrimonial Causes Act uh, because of non-disclosure fraud or undue influence. And Charlotte's going to be talking to you a little bit about barter events and what that means and what you're going to do if that occurs. Section 31 is where you're going to start and there are orders that can be varied under section 31 and orders that cannot be varied under section 31. Really, putting it very bluntly, lump sums can't be. But there's a list here uh, which is not entirely exhaustive but uh, gives you an idea of the orders that you will be able to vary under a section 31 application. Maintenance pending suit, so any interim orders for maintenance. Periodical payments and secured periodical payments, but watch out to make sure the court hasn't directed that the payee is not entitled to apply under Section 31, and that's not been dealt with at a hearing, preventing you from being able to use Section 31 in these circumstances. Lump sums by instalments, really important, case of Penrose and Penrose, both had capital letters at the beginning of their name, so we'll amend that before the slides go out to you, but that's a case you're going to want to look at if uh, you've got a case where there are lump sums payable by instalments, very different from lump sums generally. Deferred lump sums, same sort of argument applies. Pension sharing orders, but you need to make sure that that's before decree absolute or before that order has been affected, because otherwise you are in difficulty. Measure orders or orders for the benefit of children. And a property adjustment order can be varied if it concerns the sale of a property. In all other circumstances, it cannot be varied. So these are things that you're going to want to look at. Don't just assume that you've got a client who wants to vary the order because things have happened. Okay, don't worry, we'll apply. It's fine, we'll make an application. The judge will hear you. Not, uh, in not all circumstances will that happen. And please make sure that you have made the right application because your facts will apply to either Section 31 or undue influence fraud in very rare circumstances, or because there's been a barter event, uh, which again, Charlotte's going to talk to you about in due course. When I find my mouse, we'll move on. So, liberty to apply. Please be careful of just making an application um, under the liberty to apply provision because you want to vary your order. That is not what that is for. Uh, the second bullet point here, it's for working out an order, not varying it. They're very different circumstances. And I've seen a lot of um, people misunderstand that and make that application thinking, well, that's my opportunity there, that last bullet point on the order to bring it all back to court. The most important thing, and I think I've put it in bold on the next slide, is that final orders are meant to be final. The courts don't like to vary them, they're final. It has to be specific circumstances that allow you to vary it. So liberty apply does not allow a party to seek to vary, uh, uh, seek a variation otherwise prohibited by section 31, also an important point. Much and much is a, a, a sort of interesting case. It's not something that I think you should take away with you as the main part of this, because hopefully you've made the right application with the right form uh, and the right information. But in the case of much and much, the Court of Appeal decided that whilst the notice was for an application uh, for liberty to apply, her statement as well as the application allowed the court to treat it as though it was an application to vary. So it's not the end of the road if you've made a mistake, you can perhaps rely on the case of much and much depending on the circumstances of your particular case. But please, of course, try to make the right application for the right set of facts. The principles the court applies, and here it is in bold, final orders are meant to be final and that's so important that everyone remembers that don't tell your client if they come to you seeking a variation yeah it'll be fine it's it's not the starting position is that you agreed or the court made a final order and it should be final but the court will uh, subject to you having a good set of facts uh, apply a broad discretion and that's since lewis and lewis 1977 small anecdotal fact for you uh, now the court will be looking at all of the circumstances of the case not just events since the original order 
The first consideration is, of course, still the welfare of any children. That is paramount for the court. Keeping in mind, bullet point two, that the court has a broad discretion, there should be a change in circumstances since the order, uh, you consented to the order or the order was made by the court, the original financial order. Uh, it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to get an ear without something changing, because of course then why or what's happened that makes the final order not final or, or that it shouldn't be final. The court will always try to affect a clean break between the parties, same, in the same way that it does in, in any proceedings that you're going through for financial separation. Fairness is the overriding objective. The court will take into consideration the increases and decreases in the party's finances. That's not again conclusive, but it's something the court will have in mind. So if somebody's um, lost their job and they're looking after children and the order just uh, isn't workable anymore, that's something the court will have in mind. The husband, uh, and there are a few cases on this, the husband is not liable to pay, or the wife, I should say, is not liable to pay, neither party is liable to pay, for anyone's... Um, financial misconduct, FM, financial misconduct since the separation. So if you got a lump sum or your client got a lump sum because of the terms of an order and then uh, and the uh, view was that she was going to use that lump sum to buy herself a house for her and the children, but instead she put it all on a horse called Simon and Simon had three legs and lost, uh, it is not the husband's responsibility to make up for the fact with further lump sums uh, for the fact that she has... Uh, got rid of that money in um, a way that she shouldn't have. You will um, see that each case turns on its own facts, which is a really irritating barristery thing to say with all these matters, but they do. And the court will either uh, review the whole case or apply a bit of a light touch review. And that is dependent upon the facts of your case, whether the court needs to really delve into every aspect of this uh, matter, or there is a very niche point that can be dealt with on a light touch review of everyone's financial circumstances. If you've made the same application twice, you're going to be uh, struck out. And that shouldn't be surprising. Backdating, the court has an almost unrestricted power to vary orders retrospectively and to backdate payments. And it is theoretically possible to backdate payments to the date of the original application in the petition. Um, it, this is possibly slightly relevant now because of the delay the courts are having. So if you've made an application to vary and you're not going to be heard for quite some time because um, you, your case isn't suitable to be heard remotely or the court that you um, are being heard in simply doesn't have time now, uh, when you get to uh, your decision from, from a judge, consider backdating um, because, of course, uh, th there would have been a delay that's not your fault. Uh, Non-disclosure, fraud or undue influence. A second way, as I said at the beginning of this talk, to uh, make an application to vary. Very niche. I said uh, that's the last bullet point to this slide. Leading cases are very fact specific and it's not possible, um, as it's not possible with, with conduct in financial cases, to give an, a, a very conclusive list of the types of behaviour which would be sufficient to reopen an order. So um, you have to be very careful when applying um, to vary because of non-disclosure, fraud or undue influence. And it's important to note that if uh, the husband didn't disclose that he also had a um, 700 pound, I'm thinking cat, I don't know why a cat would cost that much, watch, then uh, that's not going to be enough to reopen the whole case, probably. So it has to be pertinent, full and frank disclosure um, that, has, that he's failed to provide or she's failed to provide. Um, or material non-disclosure. So minor non-disclosure is not going to be sufficient, but obviously that's going to be case dependent um, due to the nature of the assets in your particular case. Maybe that watch is going to make the difference, but probably not. So do be careful. Just as we know, finance cases are really fueled by emotion. And a lot of the time, one party will be really upset because they found out that something wasn't quite right at that hearing something she's found out oh no he has this other bank account and he didn't disclose it so actually everything should be reopened I wasn't happy with the decision anyway so let's reopen it because of that what well, depends if that bank account's got three pounds in it it's not going to do much when you apply to reopen because of non-disclosure I'm going to pass over now to Charlotte who's going to tell you a little bit more about Barda events but do remember that if you have any comments or questions please type those in the box and uh, we'll endeavour to get through those at the end of this talk Thank you, Jo. Um, okay, Barda event. So the leading case is still Barda and Barda, 1987 Family Law Reports case, and it established that a court may allow a challenge to a financial remedy order 
So an order that's already been made by the court on the ground of new events. Um, but to do so, there has to be four conditions that are satisfied. Uh, so for example, new events have occurred since the order, which invalidate the basis or the assumption on which it was likely to be made. Uh, so that if leave to appeal is out of time was given, the appeal would be certain or very likely to succeed. So it's effectively saying that, you know, had that 21 days not have elapsed, one could have appealed and it would have been uh, successful. Um, but because that 21 days uh, has lapsed, then one can look at a barter uh, situation providing that it's in relation to a new event invalidating the, uh, the order, the assumptions of that order. Uh, second, the new events occurred within a relatively short time of the order being made. It'd be extremely unlikely length of time, could be as much as a year. In most cases, it'll be nothing more than a few months. Uh, thirdly, the application for leave to appeal out of time is made reasonably promptly in the circumstances of the case. Uh, and fourthly, the grant of leave to appeal out of time would not prejudice third parties who have acquired in good faith uh, for valuable consideration any interest in the property which was the subject of a final order so one has to consider any third party's rights um, i have had for example uh, seen some discussion about whether covid19 could result in a barter barter type situation uh, so what do i mean by that i mean perhaps uh, one party may have a flourishing tourism business and um, perhaps the final order was made at uh, beginning of March, just shy of COVID-19 having really set in. And the order of that was very generous in nature, perhaps towards the wife. Um, and then subsequent to COVID-19, the husband finds himself in a situation where his tourism uh, company has collapsed and there's no money available and he's looking at bankruptcy. Given that there's only been a few months between the order having been made, COVID-19 taking place, and you can see a real nexus between the final order having been made on the basis that his company is successful and continues to flourish. And then this real change of circumstances thereafter. There's a nexus between the two. Um, one could perhaps envisage a barter situation arising, but I have certainly haven't seen any case law to that effect yet. Um, so again, as for the barter principle to apply, new events must be unforeseen and unforeseeable at the time that final family law order was made. Uh, again, very important. So it can't be something that was before the court at the time of the final order um, and the court determined that matter, that wouldn't be a barter event. It has to be something that's new. Uh, Mostyn J, Mr Justice Mostyn emphasised that unforeseeable uh, should not have a different meaning in the family division compared to other divisions of the High Court. So again, one just needs to consider what that definition means. But I mean, it's fairly straightforward, I think, to lawyers in general. Uh, Zidius agreements. Um, I've certainly done a number of cases of this nature, as I'm sure uh, my learned friend Joe has as well. Um, this comes up fairly common. So what this actually means is that if there's a dispute about whether negotiations have produced an agreement, the court has a discretion to determine whether that in fact is a binding agreement. So I see situations of this nature where uh, parties may have entered into negotiations um, at the conclusion of an FDR hearing where it hasn't resulted in a final order. Uh, they seek to thrash it out even when the court is closing and eventually they reach an agreement. It's drafted, there's heads of agreement, it's signed by the parties and there may have even been an exchange of letters as a result of that agreement. That conclusion of the FDR, when that heads of agreements drafted and it's signed, then effectively, ordinarily, it's likely that that agreement will then be binding. Uh, so how do you know whether an agreement reached at some stage is binding? Um, so it's whether an agreement has been reached always turns on the facts of the case. We know in family cases, it's pretty much fact specific. In certain circumstances, even where the parties have not reached a final agreement on all the points between them, uh, there is still sufficient agreement to bind them to a particular outcome, even the negotiations have been conducted on a without prejudice basis. So what that means is that, look, if you've gone so far as to reach an agreement, even if not every single aspect is being considered, it may still bind you and the other issues can be dealt with thereafter. So be aware of reaching a stage in negotiations where a party might be able to assert that an insidious agreement has been reached. 
Uh, so it means that a stage of negotiations where parties believe the negotiations are advanced and would be upheld as a binding agreement were a judge to be called upon to decide the point. If you think that is about to happen, then I think one needs to be very clear that that's not the intention of the negotiations that are currently under play. If the only remaining issues are issues of drafting or detail or implementation, it would suggest that this agreement has been reached. An inconsistent or manipulative litigant should not be allowed to repudiate, that means to go back on an agreement on the ground that such issues have not been clearly resolved. Now, often I tend to see cases of that nature. A litigant, often a litigant in person, has changed their mind after entering into the agreement. They regret it and so they say, look, I don't want to enter this agreement, I want the court to make a final decision. Sorry, it's just too late, we're stuck with that. In proceedings for financial remedy, uh, there has always been a clear distinction between the determination of liability and the determination of security for the performance of an obligation, the latter being a point of detail. So again, it's just a question of detail. Uh, devil is always in the detail and in a family case, it's always pretty much fact specific. Thank you, Charlotte, um, and thank you everyone for listening. A short one today, but um, something that I think crops up quite often and uh, is important to cover. We've had two questions here, Charlotte, so I'm just going to read them out. The first is, can non-disclosure, undue influence or fraud apply in non-domestic cases? I'm not sure I understand fully the question, so if perhaps whoever has asked that question should um, could uh, add a little more detail to that one, uh, and I'll get back to you. Where parties have both signed an agreed consent order, but this was rejected by the judge due to departing from equality and questions put to both parties, can one party rely on this agreement as final? Charlotte, what about that when you've got um, an agreement? Yes, I mean, absolutely. If both parties have agreed and signed up to this uh, agreement, then one party will be raising, no doubt, the argument that this is an agreed upon order, uh, it's one that we all consent to. We are free parties. We're able to make that decision. We're autonomous individuals. But the judge, nevertheless, has a final decision as to whether that order is sealed. So really, that's the overriding factor here. It's not about one party departing from that agreement in accordance with the Zidius principles. It's rather about a judge stating this is contrary to the principles set out in the Matrimonial Causes Act, often the Section 25 criteria. And as a result, the judge does have the jurisdiction uh, to be able to call both parties into court and to question them about that agreement and make sure that they both understand what they're signing up to, even if it prejudices one party over and above the other. So indeed, that can happen. But as I say, no doubt one party will, or both parties will say this agreement was final and we're happy to abide by it. <laughs> we have a thank you. I just want to um, attempt, we haven't had... Um more information from the author of the first question, but perhaps if I can try and answer it this way, we're talking of course about financial question, uh, financial cases here, but generally that principle applies to most matters and agreements between people that if there has been fraud or undue influence um, or duress, then it's going to put a question mark over whether that agreement is valid, even in civil contract cases where um, the contract might be void or voidable as a result of that uh, non-disclosure or undue influence. Etc. So, uh, can non-disclosure, undue influence, or fraud apply in non-domestic cases? Well, generally speaking, it applies to uh, most agreements. But um, if you uh, want to ask anything uh, more, then do please contact Alex Nunn, whose email address you can see on your screen now. Uh, he will get to us very quickly, and we can answer any further questions that anyone has. But uh, I think that's uh, all the questions. Oh, sorry, civil cases. Yes, well, okay, so yes, this fight, if <laughs> thank you, civil cases. Well, I think I've answered it then um, in what I've said. But again, if you, if you have any further questions, do contact uh, our clerks and they'll get, um, they'll get back to you. We do have a, a huge civil team at Goldsmith Chambers who are also doing some seminars on different topics. Uh, so please also look at the events list that I hope has been emailed to you. But if it hasn't, again, email us and we'll email it to you because there's lots more um, that uh, you should be hearing from us in due course over June and hopefully July. Uh, I think, oh, uh, shall I, just one more. I don't know if we have a little bit of time for this question. It's a question about child arrangements agreements though. They're signed by both parties without going to court. Is it in force and valid if provided to a third party? Uh, for example, for a visa application. Well, again, these are, these, um, what we've dealt with here is finance cases. 
Um, and again, I'm not sure if you are asking if, if, if there's an agreement signed by both parties, then it's binding in so far as both parties have agreed to it, so it should abide by its content. Uh, any further than that, I think um, give us an email and uh, we'll deal with your fact specific case and uh, help you that way. I think that's probably best. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, we hope to see you soon for further seminars.